Right, hello viewers, this is Craig and he has built this amazing bike designed for a very special challenge. And this video will go through the details of the bike and what you've been using it for. So what I've done uh, is I've slowly built myself up and um, been working towards a, uh, a Guinness World Record. So my, my, new, my new record is the most countries visited in 24 hours by bike. So the record as it stood at the beginning of the year uh, was eight countries. So I set about um, gearing up and uh, trying to prepare for the record. Um, I did do it last year, or I attempted to do it last year. And I set off, I did it on my old time trial bike. So that was from about 2009. It meant I was riding on sort of 23 mil tires. Um, and it was a, a full on time trial bike and very clattery. It wasn't ideal for the job, um, but I was very aware that I wanted to get as aero as I could do and uh, try and cover ground as quickly as I could. So the, the main drivers for the choosing of this bike for me uh, was threefold. Um, I really wanted to go for wire tyres. Uh, a lot of ultra races that I do are sort of over quite rough terrain. Um, I really wanted to go up to 30 mil tyres and sort of a lot of bikes that I was looking at previously uh, could only go up to about 25, 28 mil tyres. I also really, really wanted to go aero with this. So I've been sort of searching around for an aero frame that will take that kind of uh, tyre clearance. Um, and then sort of on top of that, I've been trying to tweak and uh, perfect what I had um, and make it as aero as I possibly could do. Um, so that's driven quite a few of the park uh, choices on the bike as well. So on the back, I've got uh, an Easy Gains disc cover. Um, that is uh, a fairing which I put on the, uh, the back wheel there. Um, it's really easy to go on and take off. Um, it's just got some cable ties in there and a few bolts. And it, it works really well. It makes all the noise you want from a disc. And uh, it certainly makes the bike faster as well. And going forward as well, um, I've got the same Easy Gains crank cover as well. That again is saving me a few watts um, and you know, every watt counts when you're, you're riding for 24 hours. And uh, then I've also gone for quite narrow handlebars up the front as well. Um, so those are actually 36 centimetre handlebars. So I'm quite a narrow person as it is, but the, so the aero gains of the, uh, the narrow bars meant that I could uh, make the most of my, uh, my narrow shoulders and uh, save everything I could. Um, on those I've then mounted some aero bars, so that's partly what's driven the uh, separate handlebars and stem combination just because trying to find aero bars that fit onto modern integrated bars is an absolute nightmare. So I've just got a set of, uh, sort of mix and match aero bars on there. So I've recently upgraded to carbon bars, so that's made it a bit lighter as well. Um, some aero coach elbow pads on there which I really enjoy. Um, some, some, some homemade padding because the, uh, the standard padding is not the, uh, the thickest. Very homemade. Um, it is very homemade <laughs> and uh, it looks really, really rough. But as soon as you put your elbows on there, it just disappears into the, uh, the elbow pad. So it is nice and aero, um, but it, 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 it works. And that's what mainly what I'm looking for at the end of the day. So a lot of that is sort of derived from my time trialing background. But then sort of you look around and you can see the other influences on, on ultra. So reliability and uh, sort of endurance. So you've got the dynamo front light there as well, driven off a front hub. Uh, so the front hub came as part of the front wheel. So it's quite a nice little feature that parkour uh, included in, in their service for me. So small upcharge, but it actually worked out to be a lot cheaper than buying the wheels and the dynamo separately to build it up. And uh, so the front light then drives uh, back to the rear light as well. I, just, I didn't really need it for this record because it was only sort of five, six hours of darkness. But I really like having the reliability of a dynamo there because there's nothing worse than sort of sitting there and trying to work out how late you can put on your, uh, your lights to make sure you've got maximum brightness for as long as you possibly can do. On top of the, the dynamo lights, I've also got a couple of exposure rear lights there. So those are quite nice. Um, I use those as sort of secondary lights. They're a little bit angled up at the moment, but um, I use them on a fairly low brightness just to make sure A, they last for a good long time and B, to make sure that people can, can see me. Um, I've got to be a bit careful in Europe because they can be a bit funny about flashing lights, but um, you yeah, know where I can, I use them on solid. So yeah, so that's sort of the, the big endurance part, apart from of course the bags, where I'm sort of using a mix and match collection of bags. So I've got a restrap seat pack, uh, so that's just a small sort of three to five litre seat pack. Uh, that held sort of all my spare clothes and tools and that kind of thing. Fairly minimalist in what I packed, I didn't need any sleeping system or anything like that. It was just a really long, day long ride, so um, a few bits and pieces there. Uh, I've also got a seat pack, a uh, restrap uh, frame pack as well, and uh, that held all of my nutrition. So that was completely jammed full of bars and gels. So that actually fitted in the triangle really nicely. Um, only problem I had was around the, sort of, there's a slight slope to the top, the top tube there, um, and that sort of did interfere with uh, trying to fit it, but the straps were just about long enough to, to get it on nicely. And finally, then I've got the Apertura top tube bag as well. Um, I really like that bag, it's really nice and narrow, it's got nothing on the sides and uh, sort of quite luckily I've got quite narrow thighs so it does tend to end up rubbing. 
Um, but again, because of the fabric's quite smooth, I've never had any chafing issues on my, uh, my shorts. So you know, when you're spending a lot of money on skin suits and this kind of thing, it's always upsetting when you get bobbling. So, um, so yeah, so that was a lot of what, what sort of drove uh, the decisions around the frame. Uh, the frame itself is a, an Elves Falleth uh, Evo 2022, 2023, sorry. And uh, so brand new year frame. I think it's probably the first frame that made it into the UK in this size. So this is a 61 or 4XL, which I think is generally quite big for my size, but I do have very long legs. Um, I really struggle with um, stack. And uh, actually I found this year going down to the 36 centimeters bars has really helped me with reach as well. So I have a much more normal reach for my height. Um, so that's really sort of worked out well. Um, and then I'm running on that a, a one by uh, SRAM drivetrain. So that actually worked really well for the, uh, the setup. So that's a 1044 on the rear uh, using the uh, Explore uh, rear derailleur. And then I've got a 52 uh, front chain ring there, which probably was a little bit excessive. I don't really need to be able to pedal at sort of 60 odd kilometers an hour, but I sort of wanted to make sure I had enough gears. Uh, that's bolted onto a SRAM red and quark five bolt chain ring, just to you know give it a bit of compatibility with chain rings down the line. Um, and uh, just some uh, Dura-Ace pedals. So the one by, is that a decision for air over the cranks or something else so it's predominantly aerodynamics um it's also based around the fact that I, I don't really feel the need to do two by too much i've had a winter bike which has had one by now for two years and i've never really sort of felt the gaps between the uh the, 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 the rings um the big thing that also drives everything for me is sort of um, reliability and simplicity and just you know one less thing to go wrong is just really really nice um it's one less battery to pack one less battery to keep charged and uh yeah it's, it's when you know i, I put it put a bike together myself just again because i like to be able to repair everything that i have on on there so uh yeah so it just just keeps life really simple and really smooth the ultimate coming together of uh, my my two past disciplines of uh, ultra and time trialing uh, how do you get to the point where you're, you're aiming for a Guinness World Record to travel across Europe as quickly as possible? Where's that? What's the, uh, the motivation? So it's a, it's a funny motivation actually. So it was COVID that really drove that. Um, so I started out in time trialling. Um, I sort of reached the limit of what I was physically capable of doing in time trialling. Um, the sort of point when I got to there, my, my coach said to me, you know, you want to be looking at doing longer time trials. And I sort of took him very much at his word. and. Um, broke into ultra racing in 2019. So a couple of ultra races in 2019, really enjoyed them, did pretty well in them. Um, so I did uh, Transatlantic Way and Pan Celtic Race in 2019. That really gave me quite a lot of confidence. And in 2020, I signed up to go and do um, Trans Am. That then obviously got uh, spoiled by all that went on in the world. Um, and uh, that left me in a bit of a lurch because a lot of ultra races carried over entries from the year before, which is 2021. Um, so there was, there was no races for me to sign up to in 2021 and that sort of pushed me to start looking at doing uh, sort of ultra time trials which I could just set off and do. Um, so I did the World Ultra Cycling uh, records for West, East, West uh, England in 2021 um, and that then sort of gave me a bit of confidence to build into bigger records. So in 2022, I went off and did the most countries in seven days, and I set that at 17 days, uh, 17 countries. Um, and uh, I also visited Kosovo as well, which doesn't count as a, as a United <laughs> Nations country, unfortunately. Based on that then, um, I thought, well, you know, actually I've got enough countries there I can string together in 24 hours to do the one day record as well. Um, so I essentially rode the same route a second time uh, a couple of months later last year to try and do the one day record. Um, and then with a little bit more tinkering this year, um, I turned myself around and went north to south instead and um, yeah, actually set it this time. What's the, the bigger challenge with these? I mean, the distance, the fitness, but then you've got the psychological, the mental side of it. What, what's the toughest part for you? So the toughest part for me uh, is probably around fitness. Um, I'm not a very strong cyclist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I have a lot of friends who have sort of FTPs who are 100 plus watts higher than me. Um, and just trying to get myself up to a level whereby I can sort of set a decent pace is very hard. So I do train sort of more or less 12 months of a year, um, really focusing on my, my event um, and trying to get myself into the best shape possible for it. Um, in terms of actually getting myself around, I do tend to lean on being really stubborn. Um, I am extraordinarily stubborn and that really paid off this time around. Um, it basically got me through the last 12, 13 hours of a ride. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, 
a combination of uh, innate stubbornness uh, and uh, a lot of hard work trying to get myself fit enough to get to the start line. Um, and where's this, this passion for long distance come from? What, I mean, what's inside you kind of pushing you to do these? Um, so I think I sort of I grew up uh, very much liking the idea of adventure and sort of um, trying to get out and explore and uh, see new places. Um, and um, I think one of the sort of things that I lost when I went into time trialling was that sort of ability to see new things because you spend a lot of time in a car going back and forth and yeah, a 25 mile stretch of dual carriageway doesn't inspire a grass vast amount of fun. But uh, my fiance and I often do tandem touring. Uh, so up until COVID we were going every year and it was a really nice way just to reset and see new places. And uh, you know, we cover a thousand, 1500K um, in two to three weeks and you just see new places, new things, new people. And um, it was just sort of a, a point uh, in about 2018 where I sort of felt like I really need to combine these two and find something that I, I really enjoy doing uh, with uh, a bit of racing to, uh, to make it that much more fun. Doing an organised event like you've done a few times must be quite different to doing a Guinness World Record where you have to plan it and organise it yourself and you're doing it unsupported. It must be a similar challenge in terms of distance but very different approach. It is, it's, I think it's a really interesting one. It's also a different way of racing as well. Um, so I think it's an awful lot like road racing to time trialing. Uh, so you know, as soon as you go into a, a sort of an organized ultra race, you are definitely racing against other people. Um, so there's a lot more tactics involved. And certainly when I was doing it in 2019, I, sort of, I fell foul of a few people who, who knew what they were doing an awful lot more and uh, came past me grinning when um, I was absolutely suffering and they put in a you know, huge distance over me just, just because they smiled at me. So I think there's a big element of that. Um, I think there's also a huge difference in sort of planning logic. Um, so when I'm planning my own routes, you know, I, I desperately try and keep it as flat as possible, as fast as possible, the best possible roads. Um, but you go into an organised event and you're, you're following a planned route and that planned route is often sort of planned around making it more hard, more challenging, uh, more pretty quite often as well, even though I don't always manage to appreciate it. I always find that I get to you know, these really pretty parts and I say, oh, wasn't that part beautiful? It's like, yeah, it was dark. <laughs> um, so um, I think there's a, a really different sort of mindset and logic and um, I do find with things like out and backs and this kind of thing on organised routes that they really do mess with your head. Because um, when you're sat there flogging your way up a hill just to get to a point, just to enjoy the view and turn back around again, um, it's sort of an hour of your life and you do sit there and you have to really sort of stay mentally strong and um, try not to get yourself upset by it. <laughs> you've you've travelled a no, fair way across Europe. Best and worst roads you've experienced? Ooh, uh, so worst roads are definitely Bosnia. Uh, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, so I've started off riding on a road which was, you know, like a standard British country road. Um, it then degraded into a bad British country road uh, and then into gravel and then probably into what was loose boulders and uh, dirt. Um, I say probably because I don't know, I couldn't see it, it was dark. Um, but all I could do was steer roughly wherever the Garmin track was saying to go. Best roads, um, probably the nicest roads were Croatia, um, just because they were nice and smooth and fairly flat also really reliable, but to be honest, most of, sort of uh, Central Europe have really, really good roads. Um, so it's just, it's just nice to sort of settle in and, and do the riding and not have to worry about potholes. I think the joys of living in Britain is pretty well everywhere has better roads than us now. So um, it, it all feels relatively quite smooth. So Craig, do you know how much it weighs? So I've got a feeling it's not the lightest bike in the world. Um, it's obviously got all, a lot of kit on it as well. Um, a fair bit of food has gone from it, but um, it, it certainly was quite heavy going through um, the flight. So, um, we find out. Let's do. On the scales. Guess it's below, people. That is 12.94 kilos. That is very impressive for an aero bike with all the bags. So, what do you think of the weight then? I'm quite pleased with that. Um, I don't think it held me back. Um, I certainly never felt the weight when I was going up and over hills. I think the, uh, the aeros really offset that quite nicely. Um, I mean, the, the bike itself isn't that heavy. I think an awful lot of it is in the bags. Um, I mean, certainly the, uh, the frame bag was definitely very heavy. I think that was about five kilos to start off with anyway. So yeah, no, I, I, I'm really pleased with how it's turned out. So yeah, I have, I have no, no complaints about it, even though you know, it's a relatively new bike and uh, this is its first real big test. So for a bike for this sort of world record 
braking attempt, aero and going fast is important, but comfort is also important, hence the, uh, the foam pad. So yeah. where's the, the balance, or where's the line of compromise between the two for you? So I definitely err towards the, the aero and the speed. Um, like I think there's definitely sort of a lot of argument to be had around comfort and um, sort of going faster through it. Um, I mean, my previous bike, as I say, was a rim brake bike, so I was racing on 25mm tyres. Um, I was definitely used to bouncing around an awful lot more, uh, particularly on roads like Hungary and um, last year I we went to Bosnia. You know, a lot of the roads there were really, really poor, um, so possibly even going beyond gravel at some points. Um, and it was really uncomfortable, my hands really suffered. Um, so that was one of the big things that really pushed me towards the 30mm tyres. Um, I really wanted to get something a little bit more shock absorbing. I was a bit worried when I got the frame, to be honest, because I mean, it's got a huge chunky grate uh, seat tube um, and a seat post. Uh, the fork is is pretty massive as well, um, but um, I've had no issues at all, to be fair, actually. I've gone straight from a titanium bike to this, and uh, I haven't really noticed a change in comfort at all. So yeah, so the, the modern development around uh, bigger tyres, bigger gears, has been massively helpful on ultra racing. Um, you know, even, even a few years ago when I started, you know, you were do, seeing guys who were doing it on sort of bodged up mountain bike uh, group sets and this kind of thing, um, which you just don't need to do anymore. Um, there's all kinds of options out there. And I mean, I could easily drop down to a 44 tooth chain ring on this and have a one-to-one -one gear and still have a massive top gear as well. Um, so yeah, no, it, it is, it's brilliant that you can just go out and um, just get stuff without having to do too much to fiddle with it. Thank you for sharing your bike, Craig. Uh, fascinating insights into your bike and your uh, experience. What's next? for you coming up, what's the next big challenge? The next race for me is a Pan Celtic race. That okay. kicks off at the start of July. Okay. Uh, so that's a about a week long, two and a half thousand kilometer race around right. wow. uh, France, England and Wales. Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, just getting myself ready for that and uh, preparing my bike for that as well. And we can follow you on social media and all usual places. Yep, please do. Uh, I'll put a link down below. Lovely, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, well, well good luck with that and, uh, and we'll, we'll catch up afterwards maybe. Right. Thanks so much, see you. Cool, then. thank you guys.